pandemics and COVID-19. I'm going to do a little housekeeping and I will share that this lecture is a live replay. What does that mean? We recorded this lecture and it is excellent. It's an hour and 27 minutes with Dr. Ed Neal in April of 2020. And now we're replaying it here. Um, and this is late February 2021. 20, uh, and so it's a live replay play because we're playing the recording and Dr. Ed Neal will be here for the Q&A. So do post your questions that are, for those of you watching this in the live replay now on Zoom with us, post your questions in the chat. We're gonna moderate those for Dr. Ed Neal and he'll answer those questions at the end of this lecture and also give us an update since he recorded this um, almost a year ago, okay? So this is what we mean by a live replay. I wanna let you know about what's coming up on Healthy Seminars. Um, we have our Chinese New Year sale going on until the February 19th, 2021. You can save 30% off on on-demand courses. I wanna let you know that all these free and CEU courses, so we have free lectures, these are not for CU, and then we have paid courses which are available for CU. If you click on um, on the home page, you can either click on the community unity immunity button on the home page or click on resources. It will take you to this page and it'll let you know what's happening. So here we are on February 15th, we got Dr. Ed Neal doing his talk. Again, this is a lecture, no CUs. Um, on Wednesday, we have Deborah Betts and Claudia Sikovitz talking about the history of the forbidden points and the role in pregnancy treatment. We have another one on February 22nd, what acupuncturists could do to prepare women for birth. And then you don't see it here on this calendar, but if we fast forward, you'll see um, Dr. Yvonne Farrell has a free webinar as well. Um, and at the end of the month, February 28th, we have a live webinar for CUs with um, Hamid Montakob. So um, um, lots of stuff happening. If you scroll down below the calendar, you can see some of the free offerings we're having here. So there's one with Ed. We have some mentorships that I'm gonna go into more detail about in a moment as well. So this is our community, uh, Unity, community Unity Immunity page. And this is where we just come together as a community to learn for the love of learning. So today, again, there's no CEUs, you're here for the love of learning. If you miss any of these talks that we've done over the last 10 years plus, you can find them in our library, our community library, and that's available for subscription. And so I just wanna share with you, this is the community library, so you can get to the community library and uh, we've created a nominal fee for you to have access um, to over 180 courses at the time of this recording. Other things that are happening um, on healthy seminars, I do wanna let you know, that March 2021, the ICCM, the Israeli Congress is offering some online courses and we're offering two of those bundles. One bundle is called neck and shoulder pain disorders with these five experts. So they're really going to approach how to treat neck and shoulder pain. We got Master Dong with Susan Johnson, Neuromarine acupuncture, Pony Chong, Tom Bizio, <coughs> sports acupuncture, Adi Frum talking about the balance method, and Ari Nielsen talking about Guasa. Why neck and shoulder disorders? So many people have neck pain, upper trap, and shoulder pain that if that's all you treated well, you would have a six-month waiting list. So we thought we would tackle this condition. And then people have issues with sleep. If you're not sleeping, it's hard to be healthy. Sharon Weizenbaum is going to talk about the classical herbal approach. Amid Montekov is going to talk about acupuncture. Lori, Desch Lori Deschar, so many of you are familiar with all of her writings. She's going to talk about the Tao and inner alchemy and acupuncture for um, insomnia. Yvonne Farrell is going to talk about um, her approach to with acupuncture for treating insomnia. She, you know, she's the eight extra um, expert um, and um, really influenced by Jeffrey Yuen's work. And then Jonathan Shubb is going to talk about the balance method for insomnia. So this is all on sale at an early bird rate. The coupon cannot be applied to this because it's already on sale, but I want to let you know that's available um, coming up. As I mentioned, we do have the Chinese New Year sale, lots of stuff to save. It's on recorded courses, 30%. CNY 2021 is the coupon code until Friday, the end of day, February 19th, on recorded on-demand courses only. It doesn't apply to the ICCM courses in March, and it doesn't apply to um, our upcoming live webinars that are on sale. If you go to the upcoming live webinar link, you can see what is happening. I'm mid at the end of February. Um, Susan Johnson, the best of Master Tong's magic points. Um, you can just see it just keeps going and going. Such great stuff that we have scheduled. Um, uh, Yvonne Farrell again, David Euler, and we just got lots of fabulous courses approaching. 
Before we move on to Ed Neal, I just want to let you know we have two mentorships. One is with um, Yvonne Farrell. So if you look under upcoming live webinar, we have two on April 25th. Yvonne Farrell has a series of six live webinars coming up in 2021, starting in April. And it's part of her mentorship. So you can either just take the live webinars or you can be part of her mentorship. And the mentorship, you can go to her page and find the mentorship. It's on sale right now. Um, so you can get that early bird rate and save on that. And the reason we're doing these mentorships with Yvonne Farrell, and then we have another one with, um, uh, De oh, this is the wrong one I opened up, but we have one with Deborah Betts as well. Um, and Deborah Betts, um, Claudia Sikovitz, um, and her gang, Kate Levitt, have put one on um, advanced acupuncture and pregnancy. And the reason we put these together, one with Yvonne and one with Deborah Betts's group and Claudia Sikovitz's group, is we're lacking mentorship, that peer support. Um, online learning is great. We can pause, we can record, we can fast forward, we can rewind and really learn the material. But it really is great learning when you have the opportunity to study with somebody like a teacher. And so now these have office hours where you can bring up case studies, you have a forum to discuss with your peers, and you're going to have all these extra hours where you can go over the material that you just learned with Yvonne in a group setting online. So that's what the mentorship is all about. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. All right, uh, just a disclaimer about our talk that you're about to listen to. It is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical advice. It should not be interpreted as medical advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. If you have a health condition, please seek out a healthcare provider. All right, you guys can get ready to share the video. I'm just gonna do a brief introduction to our topic today. Again, I wanna remind you that um, uh, the recording will go into the community library and avail be available by subscription only. Um, Dr. Ed Neal is both a medical doctor and a Chinese medicine practitioner. He keeps his licenses both in um, his medical uh, degree and with Chinese medicine. And his approach, his, his passion is with the classics. So that's what we're going to hear about today. Please post your questions in the chat room. We'll moderate those. And then live, Dr. Ed Neal will be there to answer your questions and give us an update. And again, these short little lectures that you're seeing here today and that are in the community library do not have CEUs with them. They're just for the love of learning. All right, let's start um, this video, please. My interest in studying the classics is actually uh, how to find innovative solutions for current problems. And so I think it's it's really good to remember that Chinese medicine, even though it's old and it's built on traditional sources, has been a history of innovation. And innovation in Chinese medicine has always been to look backwards to the past and <clears throat> touch bases with the original principles, and then look at the situation that you're facing and innovate. So that's a big interest of mine. So COVID-19 falls right under that purview. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the background of things, about the Neijing, um, some of its ideas about infectious diseases at the end. I'll talk more about treatment strategies. Um, and there's a fair amount here, so I'll just get started. <clears throat> if you want to contact me, just Google my name and you'll find me. Happy to respond to your questions. So pretty much every lecture I give on the Neijing, I have to start with this slide. And we live in modern times, and sometimes the value of old traditional sources is sometimes in question. We're not really sure what is the value. And so I have to start by reminding us all, and I know you know this, uh, by showing this slide of two people, both using acupuncture needles, <clears throat> both treating a patient, and asking who is practicing Chinese medicine and how would you know? One person is a physical therapist using a needle, another person's a Chinese medicine uh, practitioner. And it turns out that <clears throat> if you want to know if someone is practicing Chinese medicine, it's not whether they use acupuncture needles because other specialties do that. It's not if you use Chinese herbs because other specialties use Chinese herbs. So the one criteria, if you want to see if someone is practicing in the tradition of Chinese medicine, is this, is, is this question, can you trace back the theoretical basis of what they are doing to the Huangdi Neijing? And if you can, 
it's Chinese medicine. And if you can't, it's something else. So it's important to remember how central these ideas are. So if you look at the Huangdi Neijing text, I won't go into this in detail, but the ideas in the Neijing are the inciting ideas for the acupuncture tradition and the herbal tradition. Um, and <clears throat> they have the basis for all of those things. One of the interesting things about doing the Neijing research, I've been doing it for about 20 years. Um, <clears throat> one is that uh, the text seems to have an earlier origin than we thought uh, back in the warring states. And also that the transmission of Neijing medicine was cut off pretty early, um, in, probably in the early Han dynasty. Now, people have different opinions about this, but this is the results of our research. And especially in the acupuncture tradition, what we see in the Neijing text by doing the text archaeology on it is a very different picture of what Chinese medicine was, and particularly what acupuncture was. In herbal medicine, it's a little bit different because we really trace back our our lineage to Zhang Zhang Jing and the Shang Han Lun and Jingwei Yaolei. So there's a written um, <clears throat> history back to there, which is a little more clear. But particularly in acupuncture, it was a much different uh, picture of acupuncture. And I'll talk about that a little bit. So we have this idea that Chinese medicine is a, is a very old tree and we're out on the tips of the tree. And if we look at the root of this tradition, it is in the Neijing. So in the Neijing uh, are all the basic ideas of Chinese medicine, and importantly, the terminology is in the Neijing. So we have one issue right now, which is where there's a lot of confusion, confusion about terminology, and it makes this hard for us to innovate and do research and so forth. So classical texts are also a place we go back to to understand what the original definitions of things were, and then we can have a more robust conversation and practice. When I started studying <clears throat> classical texts 20, in aging 20 years ago, I was interested in, in studying it as, as for its historical value, and I thought there would be um, interesting things in there. And I thought probably there was three possibilities that I would find when I started translating. And one, the first was that the classical texts of the Neijing were mostly of historical interest, that, they, uh, that there was better techniques now, and a lot of the things were outdated. The second one was it's kind of a mixture. There were some great techniques, but it's really kind of outdated also. And the third is that it's more innovative and more advanced than what we currently know in Western medicine and Chinese medicine. And over and over again <clears throat> in my work over the last 20 years, I found it's the third one that's true, that the ideas in the Neijing are more advanced than we currently think in Western medicine, for example. It doesn't mean that the ideas in other traditions, other forms of Chinese medicine or Western medicine are bad. We're here to help patients and we want to take all the good things from all the different systems and use them together. But over and over again, I've been impressed how far ahead of the curve these people were. If we look at <clears throat> the work we've been doing over the last 20 years, we're looking at texts and I use the term text archeology, span meaning that we're treating the Neijing as an archeology span site. Um, and what we're digging when we go in and brush things away and pull things out is text. There was a, something that happened serendipitously when I was starting to study the Neijing and translated um, in, in the late 1980s, <clears throat> early Chinese texts were put on computer databases. And this was just a little bit before I started to translate the Neijing and work with the Neijing. And that has been a real game changer so when texts are on computer databases, it means we can do detailed text archaeology. We can look at character usage and phrase usage and so forth, and really start to unpack the aging in a way that hasn't really been possible before. And what we found as we <clears throat> excavate this text is it's really a much different picture, and it's a very beautiful picture with lots of um, important things for current global health challenges and so forth. Um, so when we take the text, we're looking at it as kind of a text archaeology project, which means we're kind of sweeping it away. We don't go in with a, an understanding, a pre-existing understanding that we have of what the text means or try to view it through the lens of TCM. We're trying to take the text as it stands and then taking the text fragments apart 
and brushing them off and looking at them carefully and trying to let the words speak to us to create the vision that they had. And again, these are the people that founded Chinese medicine. It's important to remember. So we're putting text in databases like this <clears throat> and line fragments and looking at them and doing research on them. When we pull the text out of the, when we to take the text out and look at it this way, um, we're kind of looking at different fragments like this and putting them in different boxes. <clears throat> and one of the things we have to do is put them in these things I call the knowledge boxes, which means that it's very important when you're looking at something, you don't know what it means, um, like a new culture, like a, an old culture from an archeology span site and you don't really know what it is, not to make an assumption right away because our minds like to make assumptions about what's there and kind of make a story about it very quickly because then we can relax. But if we, we, if we can't hold the tension of not knowing about things, we can't really get to the meat of it. So there's four knowledge boxes when we pull out text. The first is we pull out a line and we think we know what it is. The second is there are things we know somewhat. You know, you look at it and some of it you know, some of it's confusing. The third box is things we just don't know what they're talking about. <clears throat> And the fourth box is things that we don't even know that we don't know. It, it's kind of interesting. If you wanted to know which the biggest box was, it's the fourth box. There's so much in the Neijing that you don't even know what you don't know yet. And there's lifetimes worth of research and knowledge in there that we're, we're getting out. <clears throat> so when we pull information out of the Neijing, it tends to fall into four main categories. And that's technique specific, like they tell you when, when there's a certain kind of finding, put the needle in in a certain place, use a certain herb. Systems level information is information that tells us a different story about an illness. And that's gonna be important in our talk about COVID. Um, looking at an illness or a problem from a different point of view, <clears throat> that's a very valuable um, uh, kind of information. Hybrid is a mix between the two. Extrapolated information is where we take basic principles of the Neijing and extrapolate them into modern uh, <clears throat> ideas that the Neijing authors were not even aware of. Let me give you a few examples of that. So for the text specific information, we have a frequent example of that is Dr. Tu Yo Yo, who won the Nobel Prize in 2015 on malaria research. And she and her team just went through Chinese, I shouldn't say just, but they, they went through a Chinese herbal texts and just looked at the herbs that were used in febrile conditions. And then they tested them all for activity against malaria. They found that in Qinghao, the herb, that there was the artemisinin compound um, that they extracted and they use it as a medication. That's saved millions of lives. And it's a very specific, um, um, <clears throat> chemical for a kind of a problem, malaria. Kind of a system-wide information, what would that be? Well, for example, cancer is one of those. So in modern medicine, we have the idea that cancer uh, it's kind of comes and at least the story of cancer is it's something that comes and gets you, uh, like a ninja or a terrorist, <clears throat> you know, coming to kill you. The idea from the aging perspective is that when tumors grow, it's because the biological co coherence that is running through the circulation of the body goes offline and the body starts making tissue, but without the governance of the, of the, the proper circulation. And it's an ecological model, meaning that when we treat cancer, we're not trying to get rid of tumors, we're trying to reestablish normal blood flow or river flow in the body. So it gives you a whole different way of looking at a disease and that generates new research approaches and new ways of treating and so forth. <clears throat> so cancer, <clears throat> we have this idea of a biotensegrity system in the Neijing that the body is kind of a breathing system um, that has different tissue planes that are related to different directional aspects of breath and that those go offline and that's causing cancer. That's for another time, probably another lecture. <clears throat> That's the idea of a biotensegrity system. It's, a, it's the idea that comes from Neijing theory about tissue planes and tissue plane organization and about how the, how the universe operates as a breathing uh, phenomenon that the body is connect, interconnected with all these parts. And if you push on one end, it changes over here. And the basic idea is it's all moving. And one of the 
most fundamental definitions of illness from an aging perspective is a part that's not moving, basically. <clears throat> so a third would be hybrid, like tuberculosis, for example. So uh, in an aging, in early classical texts, they have specific approaches to tuberculosis, and then they have systems level ways of thinking about tuberculosis in a different way. And I won't spend too much time on that, but it's an ecological model also like cancer. And this is gonna be what we see in COVID too. And one thing I need to say about COVID right up front is, you know, from an aging perspective, the COVID illness is not about the COVID virus. And I'm sure you've heard that from other teachers on this site. It's about the ecology of the person. <clears throat> the COVID virus is kind of a, it's a hanger on. It comes and establishes residence because it's a good place for it to live but it's not here causing the problem. Um, that's really a different way we think in Chinese medicine than in Western medicine. <clears throat> a fourth way is like an extrapolated knowledge that we're getting out of this text archeology span site. So we have the idea of cancer genes or oncogenes, which was not something that the Neijing authors thought about at all, but we can take <clears throat> the models of Neijing theory and talk about the three-dimensional anatomical structure and that biotensegrity model that we talked about and talk about how if you have something, for example, in a sinew system, it's actually connected through connective tissue bridges all the way into the cell and it affects cell transcription of um, nuclear RNA, for example, and turns oncogenes on and off. So there's a whole new way of thinking about that problem, even though that wasn't even in the aging thinking at all. Okay, so that's a little background. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about the model. You have to kind of get the model to understand what their approach was. And the model really is about patterns of motion. I should say that right up front. When I started translating the Neijing in 2000, it's a very confusing text. The language is confusing, it's not clear. You can translate the same line five different ways and they're all correct and so forth. And so you need some kind of um, guide to take you through it, a key to unlock the text. And for me, that key came about 2004 when I had been translating passages and trying to make sense of them. And then one day it struck me, they're talking, all of this is talking about patterns of motion. And when I had that key and I started to understand that they were talking about how the world is formed on patterns of motion, then all of a sudden the text just fell open to me and it's changed everything. So that's like a key that you use to open the text. What does that mean? <clears throat> the Neijing perspective of the cosmos is, is that it's a phenomenon of 